Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Today what we're going to do is look at a problem of variable mass. So this is kind of a standard classical problem in physics whenever you're starting to look at a change of momentum in systems with variable mass. So we assume here that we have some cart that's moving along a flat surface. It could be moving at some velocity v and there is rain drops falling vertically into the cart as such that it's increasing the mass of the cart. So what happens to the velocity? What happens to the acceleration of the cart? Uh, when rain keeps falling into the cart and adding more and more mass to the cart. So we're gonna break this problem down. We're gonna look at the momentum and how momentum changes as a function of time to get a differential equation. And then we're gonna solve that differential equation to find the speed of the cart at any time t. Once you know the speed of the cart, then you simply take the derivative relative to time to find the acceleration of the cart. Okay, this is really a good problem. And again, if you like the problem, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel and leave some comments down below or questions and I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Let's go. Okay, so to get started, what we're gonna do here is consider this cart at two different times. Okay, so this is going to be at uh, some time t, and this is going to be at time t plus a little bit of time later. Okay, now everything here inside the cart, so that is the water that is inside the cart plus the mass of the cart and the mass of the wheels, we're going to call the mass here m at this time t. So that would be that here would be the mass of the cart and all the rain and whatever fell inside but it's going to be the mass evaluated at some later time t plus delta t, right? And this mass is increasing as a function of time. All right, the other thing we're going to assume here is that we're going to have some velocity of the cart. This is the velocity at time t, and this here is the velocity at a time later, t plus delta t, and this is going to be changing. All right, the other thing we're going to take for this problem is just to make it more general, uh, we can actually even add a force over here. So imagine someone or some object was pulling on this. So this is really some applied force. And right now we're just going to assume that that force is constant. Your problem might even set this to zero and imagine you have some initial velocity of the cart and then you see what happens. But let's solve the more general case. And at the end, you can always set the force equals to zero. All right, the first thing we wanna do is you wanna look at what happens to the momentum, again, at time t versus at time t plus delta t. So remember, our definition of momentum is always a mass of the object multiplied by the velocity. All right, and everything is going to be moving to the right, and we're gonna take that to be our positive direction. So the momentum here at time t, simply the product of both of those terms, m of t, multiplied by the velocity at that time. The momentum at the later time, t plus delta t, is equal, again, just simply the product of both of those terms. And v of t plus delta t. Oops, delta t. All right, uh, next thing we wanna do is, again, if you think of Newton's second law, Newton's second law is kind of often written like this, right? It's the change of momentum. If there's a force acting on an object, it'll change the momentum with respect to time. And it's really in the limit that you want this time interval, uh, delta t, to be very, very small. So we're gonna first focus on this numerator term over here. This numerator term is simply the change in momentum and then we'll evaluate this limit. Now the left-hand side, f, is simply this applied force. So let's go ahead now and evaluate the change of momentum, delta p. All right, so I'm gonna write it as delta p. Again, it's going to be this momentum, p of t of t plus delta t minus the earlier momentum. Okay, so now we have to evaluate some of these terms over here. So let me go ahead and substitute everything in first. m of t plus delta t. This is algebraically kind of tedious, but it's not super complicated. We're simply applying the definition. And minus uh, this guy here, m of t and v of t. Okay, so this is my change of momentum. All right, so now what we have to do now is we're going to assume now that delta t is small, okay? So if delta t is small, what you could do is you could uh, approximate 
the mass as a function of time and the velocity as a function of time. So the mass at time t plus delta t is going to be equal to the mass at some time and plus some little bit of extra mass that we're going to add. Uh, the velocity at that time t plus delta t is also going to be approximated in the same way. It's going to be equal to the initial velocity and plus some change of velocity at that specific time. Okay, so let's go ahead now and substitute both of those terms into our expression for the change of momentum. All right, so again, what we're doing now is we're simply substituting this term for that term, and we want to approximate this one here simply by this one. All right, so let's do a little bit of math. Again, this is the change of momentum. Um, so I'm going to open up a bracket here, and I'm just going to start writing m of t plus how the mass changes at that specific time. And this guy here is v of t plus how the velocity changes at that specific time. Then minus m of t and v of t. That was our initial momentum. All right, so now you've got to multiply all these terms, right? You're just multiplying this bracket. So let's go ahead and do that. So I have m of t, four different terms over here, plus, I'll just do this one first, m of t. Just make sure you kind of take your time here. You don't want to kind of right, misplace one of the deltas because then you might lead to the wrong answer. All right, this is v of t, and I have one more term as the last term, plus uh, delta m and delta v. And I still have my initial momentum term. I can't forget that one. That one is also very important. All right, now we have to look at what's constant and what changes. So let's go ahead and look at this term. So look at this first term. It's the mass at time t multiplied by the velocity. It's the exact same as the last term here. So I can actually cancel that out. That simplifies my expression quite a bit. Uh, what else do we have? We also have this term here. If you focus on this term over here, right? If delta t is small, right? Which is kind of what we said. That means this guy here is also going to be small, right? The changes of the mass and also the change of the velocity is going to be small. And it's going to be so small that we're simply going to neglect this term over here. That's an approximation. All of these other terms, they only involve one small term. They either involve delta V or they involve the change of the mass. But this one here involves two changes. So this is what they called a higher order term. So we're simply going to neglect this term. We're gonna say that it's going to be small and it's simply going to be roughly equal to zero. We're gonna focus on what's left over here. So let me write my final expression for the change of momentum. In the limit of delta t is small, we have mass of the object multiplied by the change of velocity. Now this term should look familiar to you. Now this is the new term that pops up, the change of mass and multiplied by the velocity at that term. Okay, all right, and now what we wanna do is go back to our raindrop system and we're going to look at this expression, what all the different terms mean, okay? But this is really my expression of change of momentum of the cart when there is change of mass, right? You'd see the change of mass term. If there's no change of mass of the cart, then this second term goes to zero and you simply have this common term over here, right? If you study just you know, blocks, for example, moving and the momentum is changing, it's going to result in a change of velocity. But we're going to see that there's another way you can change the momentum of the object is by adding this additional term when you change the mass of this object that's moving. And that's what this term describes. So let's go back to our cart with the rain falling and look at all these terms together. All you want to do now is simply substitute my change in momentum expression right up here into Newton's second law. And this is what it ends up looking like. Force equals to the limit when delta t goes to zero. All right, change in momentum is simply this expression right here. So it's the mass of t, uh, delta v of t, Again, all of this gets divided by delta t. So what I'm going to do here is simply divide each term by delta t. And the second term looks like this, plus delta m 
over delta t, all of this gets multiplied by this velocity here over here. Okay, so now we have to take this limit when delta t goes to zero. Now, when delta t really becomes infinitesimally small, that means that the limit of delta v of t over delta t tends towards simply the derivative of the velocity relative to time. And the second term right here is how does the mass change? Against delta m of t over delta t becomes the rate of change of the mass as a function of time. So my final expression now for Newton's second law when the mass is changing, it looks like this. So we have the mass, and here we have how the velocity changes relative to time. This is the acceleration term, plus the rate of change of the mass, a dm dt, all of this gets multiplied by the velocity at that specific time. Okay, so this is really the important equation for a variable mass system. And now we are able, we've done a lot of work right now, but now we're in a position now to go back to our rain problem and to look at these terms and to get an expression. At the end, this is really what we want. What is the velocity at time t? And uh, what is the acceleration of the object at time t given this force and given this rain that's dropping in? So let's go ahead now and solve this equation to get both of these expressions. Okay, so a couple things here. Again, remember we have my force F that is pulling on here. We're going to now assume that the initial velocity is going to be equal to V0, that's at time zero. And the initial mass of the cart is going to be M0, right? Initial mass. Now again, this rain falls over here. So we have to say something about the rate at which mass is being added over here. And that depends on how much rain is falling. So I'm going to say that, again, the mass, the rate at which mass is changing, I'm going to assume that this is constant. And I'm going to call this mu. So that's in units of kilograms per unit time. And that's simply how the mass of the cart is changing. Okay, and this here is the initial mass of an empty cart. So if this is the case, then you should be able to write that the mass at any time should be equal to the initial mass at time zero. That's just the cart and the wheels. Again, plus this rate at which I'm adding mass. And again, we're going to assume that this rate here is constant. So rain is just falling at a constant rate. So the first thing you could do then, we have an expression for the mass as a function of time. This is handy because we're going to need this term to calculate that. The other thing you could see is that we also need dm dt, and dm dt is simply this letter mu. So first step, let's substitute our expressions into Newton's second law right here. So let's go start over here. So the force, all right, so the mass as a function of time now is m0 plus the rate at which it falls, right? So this term is often is increasing as a function of time. And here is my rate of change of velocity or the acceleration term. And then our second term now is the rate at which the mass is changing. Again, that is related to the rainfall and multiplied by V of T. Okay, so what we wanna do now is get all the V terms on one side and you wanna get all the other terms on the other side, the time terms on the other side. Okay, so we have to do a little bit of algebra in order to do this. So I'm gonna first bring this on the other side. So F minus mu v of t. This here has to be equal to the initial mass plus, and again, dv over dt. All right, we're getting closer now. What I can do now is, again, you can bring this term in the denominator, and you can bring all the time terms on the other side. Okay, so at the end, make sure you understand this step right here, because this is kind of a critical step. Um, you should get a differential that looks like this. So again, dv, I'll bring this green bracket down at the bottom over there. So it ends up being f minus mu multiplied by v of t. And there, that here has to be equal to, again, all the time terms are over here. So here you have dt, and here you have over m naught plus 
mu of t. So all the terms over here are okay, and this is fine. Now what you want to do is simply integrate both sides. We want to integrate, for example, from zero all the way to some time t. So really what I'm going to do here is just to change a variable, just turn this into a dummy variable, because I really want to just have the final expression in terms of time. And again, um, on this side, when I integrate, here I'm going to be integrating from some initial velocity to some final velocity v. And again, this is just a dummy variable for the integration now. All right, this uh, integral is actually pretty straightforward. So let's kind of go over here and work on this side a little bit. All right, this is going to be equal to, again, this one, if you're not sure, you can just look it up also, but this one is one you should be familiar with. It's the natural log of uh, this term. So this is F minus mu V prime of T. Again, this is going to be, again, there's a term in the front here because uh, to deal with the factor in the front of the velocity term. And here, this here has to be evaluated between the limits of integration. All right, on the other side, on the right-hand side of my expression, I'm going to have a similar term. I'm going to have, uh, again, one over mu. In this case, it's positive because it's a positive, it's plus mu. Again, you get natural log of the term in the bracket here, m naught plus mu of t. Again, this is going to be evaluated between the limits of uh, zero and at time some final time t. Okay, so what you do now is you simply substitute the limits of integration. First of all, you can cancel out the mu's, they cancel out, but you still have a negative sign that's left over, so be a little bit careful with that one. All right, and now we substitute our expressions. So once you take the limits, you simply get natural or uh, negative the natural log of so this f minus mu, the final velocity divided by f minus mu multiplied by the initial velocity, v0. And the right-hand side, again, this is, again, natural log, big bracket, m0 plus mu of t, divided by, again, when you substitute 0, the second term goes away. And here you're simply left with over m0. So to take this one step further, what I want to do now is eliminate these natural logs. And to do that, you have to just be a little bit careful with this negative sign. We have to kind of swap both of those, right? You use properties of the natural log. And if you do that, your final expression should look like this. You have the V0 term now in the numerator, and you have just the term with the velocity in the denominator. And this one you don't have to flip because there's no negative in the front. So it's simply m0 plus the rate of change of the mass multiplied by time divided by that initial mass. And here you go, folks. Man, we've done a lot of work. and We're still not done because, again, what we're really looking for is what is this velocity as a function of time. So let's continue this and find that expression. All right, so my goal is to get v of t by itself. So let's do a little bit of algebra over here. So I should be able to show that f minus mu v of t, that's just bringing this whole bottom term in the numerator over, over here, has to be equal to m naught divided by this term. And that gets multiplied by this whole term over here of f minus this. Okay, again, keep doing it, keep working. You gotta get this by itself over here. Um, so we got to do one more algebraic manipulation over here. So that means this is going to be equal to F and then minus all of this M naught, M naught plus mu of T, F minus mu V naught. <laughs> okay, we're getting there. What I want to do now is maybe combine, put both of this on a common denominator. So let's go ahead and do that. So this becomes F, and then minus this whole term of M naught multiplied by F minus mu V naught. <laughs> All of this is in over the common denominator now of M naught plus mu of T. Okay, now you can simplify some of the terms here. If you multiply this F, you know, you're gonna see that some of those terms are going to cancel out. All right, so this is what it looks like now. You multiply that through, and we're almost done here. So you get mu v of t 
again, canceling out all the terms, uh, we're left with is this expression here, F mu multiplied by time plus mu, the initial mass and the initial velocity. And all that gets divided by M0 plus, again, this extra mass term that we're adding. Now you can tell that mu is involved in all the terms. So you can actually just eliminate it here. All right, and this is it now, folks. My final expression for velocity. That was a lot of work, but there is a lot of physics kind of captured in this final expression. So we're going to go examine some of the limits, and this is always a good idea when you get an algebraic expression. Does it make sense for this particular problem? So let's go see what it means. Okay, first limit is the simplest one, the obvious one. What if there is no rain? And again, all we have is a force that is pulling on it. Well, in this case, it would be pretty easy, right? Because if there's no rain, <laughs> that means that the mass doesn't change and mu would have to be equal to zero because that's the rate of change of the mass. So if you look at what the velocity looks like in this limit over here, setting mu equals to zero, we get this, plus the initial mass multiplied by the initial velocity, and over, you still have the initial mass, but you don't have this extra term over here. So that's it. So what does this look like? Well, this is F over M naught multiplied by T. And this term here, the initial masses cancel out. So you're left with simply V zero. Well, this is exactly what I would expect, right? This term right here is simply the acceleration of the object. Acceleration would be the force divided by the mass, the initial mass, the mass is not changing. So this is what the velocity would look like, right? It would be increasing linearly with time. So it would kind of simply look like this V naught plus an acceleration multiplied by the time. All right, so that's kind of what we would expect in that limit right over there. All right, what about another limit? What if, what would happen now if we would have um, the force equals to zero? So let's take that other limit, right? What if F equals to zero? So again, this cart was initially moving like this at some initial velocity. If there is no force, but the mass keeps dropping in, what do you think happens? So it's getting heavier and heavier. Let's look at our expression for V of T. All right, so if there's no force, well, again, this term here would go to zero. So forget about even writing it. So what you end up getting is the initial velocity multiplied by the initial mass but the mass keeps changing. So you still have this denominator term over here. So as time gets longer and longer, what happens, right? So as T tends toward kind of very long time, you see that the mass gets really, really big, okay? And if the mass gets big, what that means is that the velocity is going to slow down and eventually go to zero. Okay. Uh, one thing you can look at for this expression is if I bring this numerator term on the other side, <laughs> watch what you get. You get mass plus mu of t, v of t is equal to m naught v naught. What do you think this term is? All right, this here is the initial momentum. What do you think this term is? This here is the mass at any other time multiplied by the velocity at any other time. This here is simply the momentum of the object at that other time. So if there is no force, right, in this limit, momentum has to be conserved. All right, so that's also another cool limit you can write out. Momentum is conserved. This is also really easy to write down. If there is no net force, you can automatically kind of just write this expression. This is the momentum at time t. This is the initial momentum. They have to be equal to each other. All right, what is the acceleration of the cart, right? The acceleration of the cart, well, acceleration of the cart, I would simply write as A is equal to, how does the velocity change with respect to time? The rate of change of the velocity. And I have an expression here for velocity as a function of time. So what do we have? Well, again, what I'm gonna do to evaluate this is simply use the quotient rule, okay? Because I have a function of time in the numerator and a function of time in the denominator. So the quotient rule now is simply, you take the derivative of the top relative to time. So that is simply F and multiplied by the function at the bottom. 
All right, then you have to switch them around. And it's going to be the first function in the numerator multiplied by the derivative with respect to time of the bottom one. Again, that is simply mu. And all of this gets divided by the function in the denominator squared. Again, this is just the quotient rule. Let me just write this on the side here. Just in case you don't remember. Now again, we have to simplify some of the terms because some of the terms are going to simplify and they always do. And at the end, my final expression now for the acceleration, it's really as a function of time, is equal to F uh, multiplied by this initial mass and minus, there's only one of these terms that survives, mu, m naught, v naught, and you still get all the term in the denominator. I can't forget to square that. And that's it. I mean, it's kind of a complicated looking thing, but given the properties, we could figure this out. All right, again, if the F, if the force is zero, you can see that the object is going to slow down. The acceleration is negative. Negative simply means it's going to slow down. Okay, and if there is a force, this is the most general expression. All right, so you can have fun now examining some of the different limits that you can have given all the properties of this problem. And this is kind of a really nice problem. I think if you can go through the steps, it takes a couple times in order to master this, but once you got it, this is very, very powerful.